Good evening, listener. Thank you for joining me here at Dark and Disturbed Tales. I am your Master of Ceremonies, Steve Taylor. This story contains violent and graphic content and may be disturbing to some viewers. Listener discretion is advised. In the battle of man versus machine, the victor has yet to be named. Tonight, we rejoin our protagonist as he fights for the right to exist in a world of microchips and silicon. Without further ado, I present to you the final installment of The Replacements, The Day They Took Over. Written by Leon Hamilton and Nightwatcher.666. Narrated by Beatles Fan Eyes. Featuring The Ghost of 94, Creepy Face, and Duchess of Darkness. You're listening to KWTF Radio, 66.6 on your AM dial. And this is The Whole Truth, with your host, Max Truth. Welcome, Truth Seekers. You have found the truth. Well, folks, I hate to be the one to say I told you so, but if the shoe fits, wear it. On our last broadcast, I told you what was coming, and now we're knee-deep in that funky brown stuff. I've got reports from as far away as Texas saying people are being replaced. It's not just our jobs, folks. They want the whole enchilada. I, for one, ain't gonna let it happen. I will not go quietly into that long, dark night. If you're hearing my voice, Dust off those implements of self-defense and do what needs to be done. My producers are telling me we've got to pay some bills, so we'll be right back after this commercial break. With the lab blazing in our rear view, we hit the road and headed for the industrial district. Phil thinks that's the only place someone could hide his rig, so we're going there to find it and hopefully his girlfriend. Thanks to a minor miscalculation on my part, we had to stop for gas. Technically, we didn't have to find a station. We'd brought enough gas to last, but Phil insisted. I knew it was for cigarettes and possibly beer. Still. I didn't argue. The truth was, the last few hours had been totally fucked up and I needed a break. I'd shot my best friend, then watched his grandmother get her head blown off. (sighs) It was a lot to process. I was still having trouble convincing myself They were fucking robots. We hit our first station somewhere around Highland Park. When we pulled up to the pump and stopped, Phil looked over at me. Not sure I thought this through. We ain't gonna be able to just walk in there and put 20 on two. Dollars to donuts, says the guy behind the counter's a mandroid. How do you want to handle this, hoss? It was fucking mind-blowing to see him being so nonchalant about everything, as it was kind of pissing me off. I had to physically shake the thought of strangling him out of my head before I could respond. Well, 
This was your idea. Figure it the fuck out. I'll be here when you get back. Narrowing his eyes at me, he nodded his head. Phil huffed and got out of the truck. Closing the door and glaring at me through the broken window, he held up four fingers on his right hand, then pointed to it with his left. You see that? That's the number of times old Phillies come through in the clutch. The least you can do is get my six on this one. The last thing I wanted to do was get out of my truck, but he was right. He had saved my ass more than once, and if we were going to survive, <sighs> we better do it together. Irritated by his habit of being right, I unbuckled my seatbelt and got out. Fine, but if anything happens, it's your fault, asshole. Oh, come on, man. We're like the Lee brothers. You can be Jimmy, and I'm Billy. We come to kick ass and smoke some hash. And we're fresh out of dope, so guess what time it is. I stopped walking and looked at him. Jimmy, what are you? Wait, was that Double Dragon reference? Jesus fucking Christ, this isn't a fucking gang. Those things are trying to fucking kill us. Phil laughed. Trying and failing because we're fucking awesome. Besides, I'm pretty sure this guy ain't one of them. Toasters don't have acne. Oh, fuck. Speechless. I took a deep breath and followed him into the store. As the chimes above the door sounded, the kid behind the counter barely acknowledged us. He glanced up from his phone for a second and took a look, and, but other than that he didn't move. Just as I thought, Phil grabbed two six-packs of beer, a bag of Funyuns, and some beef jerky before going to the counter and asking for smokes. As the cashier turned to get the smokes, the chimes above the door sounded and walks in a curvy, smoking hot brunette, wearing jogging shorts and a t-shirt. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't mesmerized by this woman. Holy God. Lucky for me, I wasn't the only one. Both Phil and the cashier were ogling her as she strolled over to the coolers for a bottle of water. Before she could turn around, the three of us snapped out of it and finished our business. The cashier was in the process of bagging everything up when she stepped in line behind us. It wasn't until that exact moment that I realized just how odd this situation was getting. We hadn't seen any normal people since all this bullshit started. Now there were four of us in one place? My heart dropped and everything slipped into slow motion. The few seconds it took for the cashier to hand fill the bag felt like an eternity. The moment the bag hit his hand, I was headed for the door. When the chimes sounded, the door slid open and a wave of relief hit me. I had to laugh. I, I'd almost had a panic attack because normal people were around. This shit was messing with my mind and I was having a hard time keeping it together. When we got back to the Suburban, I realized we hadn't paid for gas. I thought we were stopping to fuel up, man. We didn't get gas. Tossing me the bag of beef jerky, Phil chuckled. Yeah, you need to eat some. Fuel up. Why would I pay for gas? You got a shitload of it right here. There were so many things I wanted to say that I wound up speechless again. He shrugged it off, then unstrapped one of the gas cans from the roof rack. As he disappeared around the other side of the truck, 
I leaned against it and closed my eyes for a second, letting out a sigh and tilting my head back. I relaxed a little and tried to focus, gathering my thoughts. A question came to mind. I was just about to say something when laughter caught my attention. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I thought it was Phil till I opened my eyes. Standing a few feet away from me, with a big smile on her face, was one of those little fucking shining girls from the lab. I hadn't got a I hadn't got a good look at them before now, but that oh my god she was right in front of me I I winced everything about her was wrong first off her bright red hair was uneven and made up of different textures the combination made her look like a test dummy or for or, or something I just don't know next was the shape of her skull it it reminded me of a light bulb and uh, and uh, her mouth the, the fact that her mouth was too big for her face when she smiled her chin was so small that all i could see were her teeth just above that her oddly shaped nose was a a little off center giving her a face a, a weird angle but worst of all but worst of all it, it was her eyes they were these shiny solid black circles that were spaced way too far apart from a distance they looked like buttons giving her an almost doll like appearance last but not least was her body she looked less like a kid and more like a tiny adult wearing kids clothes trying not to make any sudden moves i nervously called out to phil hey phil they found us i guess he couldn't hear me because he stepped around the back of the suburban and froze when he saw the girl standing there. Holy shit! The fucking Grady twins are back. Where's the other? Before he could finish this question, the other little shit dropped down from the canopy and landed on him. The impact sent them both to the ground. As they smacked the pavement, the other one charged. Laughing, she closed the distance between us and punched me in the balls. It happened so fast that all I had time to do was double over and let out a wheezing breath before I collapsed. Between having my testicles driven up into my body and the twins' laughter, I couldn't think straight. I was pretty sure she had just ruined my sack. And on top of that, that little bitch was laughing at me, gasping, trying to catch my breath. I glanced over and saw Phil getting up. It was hard to focus through the tears and in my eyes, but, but from what I could tell, they were beating the hell out of him. The one from the camp canopy was on his back with her arms wrapped around his neck while the other one danced around him kicking at his legs little fucking evil bitches as my vision cleared he kicked the one in front of him and backpedaled and slammed into the suburban smashing the other one between his body and the truck even through the pain that really hadn't faded I managed to get halfway up before Phil grabbed me by the arm, pulled me to my feet, and we made a run for the store. 
doing my best to keep up. I hobbled along behind him, thinking those little fucking robot shits be, would, would be on us in a second. I'm not sure how we made it across the lot and in the store, but as the door shut, Phil shouted, Don't let him in! Lock the fucking door! The cashier, who'd been chatting with the hot chick at the counter, mashed a button near the register and we heard the locks engage. To be honest, I fully expected the little fuckers to come crashing through the glass and attack us, but they didn't. Instead, the two of them stood there smiling at us. They did something strange. They started singing Ring Around the Rosie. What the fuck? There was an odd moment of unified silence as all four of us stood there watching the two twisted little girls having fun. A few seconds later, the cashier finally spoke up. You can't be serious. Why are we locking the doors? They're just... He trailed off as he got a good look at the gruesome twosome. Then his head shook. What the fuck? Why do they look like that? What's wrong with them? Still in a fair amount of pain, I winced and turned and looked at him. Everything! They've been trying to fucking kill us for the last few hours. Please tell me you've got a gun in here. Oh, come on. They're just kids. They're probably masks or something. This is one of those prank videos, isn't it? You guys are all in this together. As soon as I pull a gun out, the cameraman is going to pop out and say, It's just a joke. And everybody gets a good laugh. Is she part of this? The woman at the counter held up her hands and stepped back. I came in here for a bottle of water. I have no idea what's going on. Shut the fuck up. What the hell is wrong with you people? The problem's outside. We ain't got time for this shit. At this point, the lady stepped away from the conversation and and was standing off to one side, still believing this was a prank. The cashier, Eddie, mockingly held up his hands, then pulled a Beretta from under the counter and sat it down. A strange expression crossed the woman's face when the pistol came out. I couldn't tell if she was scared at the sight of the gun or or if it irritated her. Is that really necessary? They're kids. Can't we just scare them off? <laughs> I scoffed. No offense, lady, but that's fucking stupid. They just beat the hell out of us in the parking lot, and I'm pretty sure waving our arms and making noise won't fucking work. So shut the fuck up. For some reason, Eddie took that as a cue to jump back in the conversation and suddenly I was in a three-way argument. We went around in circles, hurling insults at each other till Phil put his fingers in his mouth and whistled so loud I thought my eardrums would explode. And he repeated the same thing he just said a couple of seconds ago. Shut the fuck up. What the hell is wrong with you people? The problem's outside. We ain't got time for this shit. Even in my fucked up state, I found it weird that Phil repeated the the exact same <laughs> Phil repeated the exact same line he just said in the same intonation and delivery. It it was like a fucking tape recorder on rewind well fuck it 
With that said, Phil stormed over to the counter and, and reached for the gun. The second his fingers touched the grip, the chick grabbed his wrist, snatched back while sweeping his legs out from underneath him. In the blink of an eye, Phil was on the floor and she was leaping over the counter attacking Eddie. The guy never stood a chance. The shock of everything left him stuck on stupid. The instant her feet hit the floor, she punched him square in the forehead. A loud, meaty thwack left a full-sized dent in his skull. Eyes bulging, blood gushing from his nose. Eddie staggered back and let out a sort of, go on, like he was trying to say something. When he backed into the cigarette display, the woman stepped in and hit him with a second blow to the chest and a third. I heard bone snap. This time, she wasn't done. She focused a flurry of strikes to the center of his chest till she drilled into his body, pulverizing his heart and lungs. In the time it had taken her to do that, I'd help fill up and grab the gun. It's hard to explain what happened next. I could see myself pulling the trigger over and over and over, but I couldn't feel it. I didn't come to my senses till the gun clicked empty, and there was smoke coming from the barrel. I stood there staring at what was left of Eddie for a second, until I noticed the woman. I knew the bullets would have done some damage, but I wasn't expecting to see what I saw. Her back was to me when I opened fire and one of the shots had gone through the back of her head and blown her face out. Normally, that statement would be followed by a graphic description of brain matter and skull fragments splattered everywhere. In a way, I think that would have been better than what I saw. Her face or faceplate or whatever the right term is had been blown off. Wait, let me rephrase that. It was more open than off, sort of like a door. A flap, a flap of skin on the right side kept it from detaching, revealing what was behind it. I'm not sure why seeing that somehow seemed worse than looking at Eddie. Blood and guts register in my mind. I, I can almost accept seeing that. But what I was looking at completely threw me for a loop. I knew they were fucking robots. I understood they weren't real, but I couldn't wrap my mind around what was in front of me. Behind that face was an amalgamation of wires and machines. I couldn't begin to comprehend. <sighs> uh, oh, God. Seeing that shit almost shut my brain down. And if that wasn't bad enough, the fucking face was still moving. She blinked her eyes a couple of times, then smiled and slowly started moving her fingers. Phil, who'd been standing right behind me, shoved me out of the way, then reached over the counter and smashed the release button for the door locks. Grabbing me by the arm, he told me we had to get the fuck out of there and make a break for the Suburban. <clears throat> when, when the chime sounded, the doors opened. I was relieved to see the twins were gone. We darted across the lot as we got to the truck and I looked back. The woman was back on her feet, standing over the cashier's body. 
It looked like she was talking to him, but we didn't stick around to find out what the fuck she was saying. Sector 7B. Clear. Anomaly 37. Currently moving south. Has been updated to a level 4. Subtarget Anomaly 179 has been neutralized. No DNA required. Initiating Protocol 9. Activate all unassigned units. Capture and contain primary. Anomaly 37. We had been on the road for a few minutes before I finally broke the silence. She got up. I shot her in the fucking head and she got the fuck back up. I emptied the magazine on that thing. I, it didn't even fucking phase her. What the... Uh, how, the how are we supposed to stop these fucking goddamn fembots? I don't know what to tell you. Use bigger bullets. Besides, you probably just missed the sweet spot. Hell, half of your fucking shots went into the wall, and what was up with that? Why'd you go all Rain Man on me back there? What happened? I didn't know how to answer the question. Thinking back on it, my mind had gone blank. All I remembered was the gun clicking empty. Rather than coming up with some lame-ass excuse. I shrugged it off and shook my head. Phil nodded as if he understood what I was saying and chuckled. Yeah, that's about the size of it. Shit's freaking me out, too. The way I sees it, the faster we get out of here, the better. I know one thing for sure. I ain't getting out of this truck without a gun. The last time was the last time. You got my word on that. I couldn't have agreed more. If we had taken... Fuck. If we had taken our guns with us, none of that would have happened. I'm still not sure why we didn't. A part of me wanted to believe it was because we're not used to carrying weapons all of the time. The more I thought about it, I couldn't remember putting the guns away. I knew the rifles were in the back compartment, but we had our pistols on us. And when we got in, I recall setting my Norinko on my lap. Phil had taken off the holster and sat the cold in the back seat. Looking into the back seat, I paused. Both guns were sitting there. How did I not remember putting my gun back there? better question. Why would I put it back there at all? Chalking it up to chaos of everything, I pushed the thought out of my mind and tried to relax. <sighs> Phil was driving again, so I spent my time just staring out the window. Every once in a while I'd see lights in a house or catch movement in a yard. At first it made me feel like we weren't alone, but I wondered if we were the only ones fighting back. There had to be someone somewhere out there making a stand. On numbers alone, there had to be thousands if not millions of people willing to fight for the right to exist. Just where in the fucking hell were they? With that thought stuck in my head, I started trying to do the math. In any case, I guess Phil got sick of the silence and turned turned on the radio. He'd left it tuned to 66.6. So, of course, the first thing we heard was... For those of us not drinking the Kool-Aid... This is proof. The chemical spill is a hoax. It's a cover-up. We're live right now from the scene of a raging house fire. All emergency lines are down, and, brace yourselves, we can see at least one casualty. 
If you're just now joining us, welcome truth seekers. You've found the truth. As usual, if you want to see what we're seeing, join us at MaxTruth.com. But be warned, tonight's content is graphic. A quick recap. We were continuing our live coverage and spotted the flames from the highway. When we arrived, we found the house on fire and attempted to contact the authorities. We're now about to see if we can help what appears to be an elderly woman lying on the sidewalk. There was a brief moment of shuffling as Max and his cameraman approached the body. We already knew what he was about to see, but for some reason, I wanted to know how he would react. I didn't have long to wait. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit, what am I looking at? What is this? I, uh, I'm sorry. My apologies, folks. I am at a loss. I have no idea what this is. It appears to be a person, but it, it, it's not. From what I can tell, it's a, a machine. It's been shot full of holes and its head's been blown off. It doesn't have any burns on it. I'm not sure if it came from the house. She's... I mean, it's lying on the sidewalk near the street. There's glass on the ground around her. Looks like it could have come from a car window. Maybe someone got away from this thing. If any of you know anything about this, give us a call at KWTF Radio or contact MaxTruth.com. <laughs> Wait. Aim the camera over there. Is that a is that a kid? Oh my god. It is. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we found a survivor. Hey! Little girl! It's okay! We're here to What the fuck? Shit! Go! Go, go, go! Get back to the van! Run! <laughs> there were a few seconds of panicked voices running. Then the station cut to a commercial. Is the world wearing you down? Do you need an escape from the harsh realities of life? If so, boy, have we got the vacation for you. We here at Delos are dedicated to delivering a one-of-a-kind experience that will change your life. So call one of our Delos booking agents, choose the world of your choice, and we will set you up in Westworld, Roman World, or Medieval World. Boy, have we got a vacation for you. Shaking my head, I turned off the radio. This can't be real. It just can't be. What? What's the point? Why? Snap out of it. We just watched some kid get beat to death by the hottest chick I'd ever seen. This is real. It's happening right here, right now. And you need to face that shit before you get us both killed. We know. It's crazy. It's fucked up. It don't make a lick of damn sense to me. Get over it. The question is, what are you gonna do about it? <sighs> Taking a deep breath, trying to ignore the fact he just cut me off. I thought about it for a second. Yeah. <laughs> she was pretty fucking hot. Phil burst out laughing then quickly got serious when he saw the warning lights of the train tracks flashing ahead of us. As we got closer, we saw a car waiting, but the train wasn't moving, rather than waiting. We detoured, trying to find a way around the train, but it didn't work. All the roads leading to the industrial sector were fucking blocked. Pulling up yet to another blocked crossing, Phil put the truck in park, grabbed his gun from the back seat and got out. I watched him for a second to be sure he wasn't flipping out, then grabbed my gun and went to see what he was up to. 
He was standing there looking further down the tracks. As I approached, when he noticed me standing there, he pointed to something in the distance. That's the junction point. We can't get there in the truck, but we can walk down there and get a good look. It might tell us how far this train goes. I'm pretty sure we're going to have to double back, but I want to make sure we ain't giving up too soon. Are you out of your fucking mind? If you think I'm going down there to see what we already know, there's no way around it. This is a fucking waste of time, you asshole. Phil scoffed, then turned and headed toward the crossing he pointed at. I yelled. You've got five minutes, asshole. After that, I'm fucking gone. Without looking back at me, he held the keys up and jingled them and laughed and kept walking. Well, fucking shit. Mentally kicking myself for not paying attention, I hurried to the back of the truck and grabbed a couple of guns. Once they were loaded and the truck was locked, I jogged to catch up with him. After trading the keys for the shotgun, we stepped off the road and headed towards the junction. When he first pointed it out, I could have sworn it was fairly close, but after walking for five or ten minutes, we still hadn't reached it. Just when I was about to tell Phil we should turn back, he stopped. Did you hear that? We stood there for a second before he chuckled and pointed further down the tracks. That's the sound of me being right. The nose always knows. I could smell it. Damn, I'm good. A few blocks that way and we can roll right by this thing. Pointing east and turning his face to me, he paused and went wide-eyed, glancing over my shoulder. Motherfucker! Turning to see what he was looking at, I instantly got angry. There were two people by my truck. One was looking out while the other was getting in the driver's seat. I was pretty sure they couldn't get him started. I theft-proofed the shit out of him. But I didn't want them screwing up my ignition and cranking or cracking or breaking the goddamn steering column. Most of all, I didn't want them to find what was in the truck. There were enough guns and ammo in there to start a fucking war. If they got their hands on it, we would be in deep shit. It was right about there I made an important discovery. Running on rocks is next to fucking impossible. Anyone who's ever been near railroad tracks can tell you, rocks are everywhere. If you're not careful, you'll probably destroy your ankles and probably lose a few teeth as you hit the ground. I guess the crooks knew the rocks would slow us down the moment we started hustling towards them. <sighs> the lookout spotted us and yelled. When we got a little closer, I realized the lookout had been a woman. She was frantically trying to get the older guy out of the truck. By the look of it, he didn't want to give up, so the woman took off running without him. At this point, Phil and I had to make it to the street. He took off after the woman, and I rushed to the truck. Get out of the goddamn truck now, motherfucker! Slowly raising his hands, the asshole in my truck stammered. E easy, pal. Don't shoot. I'm getting out. I ain't your fucking pal. Get the fuck out of my truck now. I punctuated my statement by pointing my shotgun directly at his face. He got the point. Keeping his hands up, he slowly got out of the truck and stood there so I could see him. He was wearing a button-down polo shirt, blue jeans, and a pair of running shorts. The guy was dressed like he was fresh from the suburbs. 
I, I almost did a double take. Now that I had him out of the car, I had no idea what to do with him. I remembered seeing cops on the television shouting, Get down on your knees, cross your feet, and put your hands on your head. So that's what I told him to do, and it worked. I was shocked by how good it felt having someone follow my commands. It wasn't long before Phil came back with the woman walking in front of him. Something about seeing him direct her to join her partner bothered me. When we first spotted them, my only thought was to get them away from the truck. Now that we had them at gunpoint, I was trying to... I, I didn't know what to fucking do next. The woman to be... <sighs> the woman looked to be in her late 30s or early 40s. She was slim with a nice build and short blonde hair. The pair of them seemed to be so out of place I couldn't help but think they were drones or robots. They were just too goddamn perfect. From their clothes to their flawless skin, their neatly manicured hair, everything about them just felt artificial. The situation was so out of control, I, I didn't know what to say. <sighs> Picking up on my hesitation, Phil stepped in and took over. Bonnie and Clyde here look like they're fresh out of the box. Cut the shit. We know you ain't real. Why are you doing this and where the hell is Debbie? Of course they swore up and down they didn't know anything. So Phil turned up the heat, stepping closer and aiming the shotgun at Bonnie. He started counting down. In his attempt of intimidation, he had gotten closer and closer to her. When he made it to within three steps, she swatted the barrel of the gun and lunged at him. I didn't know if this was their plan, but the guy took that as his signal and he came at me. I was so caught up in watching Phil, I hadn't noticed Clyde. And I, in just an automatic reaction, I realized what was happening. I already had the barrel of the gun pointing at him. I racked it and fired. Time stood still as Clyde's screaming filled the air. I was having trouble processing what I was seeing, but before I could fully grasp the situation, another gunshot made me turn around. In the chaos of the moment, I turned my back on Phil and Bonnie. When I turned to see what was happening, things got worse. Phil was standing over, over a now partially headless corpse and brain matter was splattered on the pavement. I couldn't breathe. My stomach tightened and my vision got a little blurry. Clyde's wailing faded into the background noise and then completely stopped. All I could hear was the pounding of my own heart, if that wasn't bad enough. The smell drifted in. The combination of cordite, blood, and partially digested food made me gag. I'd shot. I'd... The shot I'd fired hit Clyde in the stomach and blew a hole out the back of him. His spine and innards and guts were all over the ground and he was rolling around clutching a fistful of intestines trying to keep the rest of them from, rest of them from spilling out. Lucky for him, he didn't last much longer. Like I said, his screams were gone by now. 
The moment he stopped breathing, my knees buckled and I collapsed to the ground, shaking and unable to control my breathing or anything else. I was trying not to cry, realizing that I'd just killed another human being. I, I wish I could say I blacked out or fainted, but the truth is my body just went numb and I began shaking uncontrollably. I was wide awake, but I couldn't move. The shock of everything left me stuck in a stupor. I don't know how long I was on the ground and as the world spun around me. At some point, I remember Phil helping me up. As soon as I hit my feet, my stomach lurched and I puked my guts out. Things got very hazy after that. I didn't remember getting into the truck or giving Phil the keys. I was so out of it. The only thing I slightly recall was seeing what I thought was the hot chick from the gas station. It might have been my imagination, but for a second, I could have sworn I saw her watching us from the roof of a building. When I tried to point her out, she was gone. Phil said he believed me, but I got the feeling he was just trying to keep me calm. Letting the conversation die, I sat staring into the side mirror and just looking down at the ground. This is Surveillance Unit T-800 reporting. The anomaly, number 37, has terminated two humans, a male and a female, zero value. Further observation indicates that the target human is beginning to suffer mental distress. At the end of the confrontation, target, number 37, showed signs of distress, body shaking, and loss of voluntary control. His legs became weak, and he fell to the ground. The human was in mental distress for approximately 15.68 minutes. There is a 76.3% probability that all mental faculties will continue to degrade due to continued shocks to his mind and system. I will continue to observe the target. Results have been logged and filed. End report. It took a while for the adrenaline dump to wear off, but when it did, I was exhausted. Just sitting there in the quiet truck in the countryside while waiting for the train to move, I dozed off. The warm sunlight on my face made me turn away from the window and pull the blanket up over my head. As I tried to go back to sleep, my cat, Mr. Poe, decided it was time for breakfast. He hopped up on the bed, purring and pawing at my face through the blanket and walking all over me. I gave in, pulling the cover back I gave him a sleepy smile and I was so happy to see him. I laid there for a few minutes, staring up at the ceiling. It, it was, it was all a nightmare, a bad fucking nightmare. Phil, the fucking robots, the murders, none of it was real. Oh, thank God. 
shaking the images of Bonnie and Clyde out of my head. I slowly slipped out of bed and headed for the restroom. With that out of the way, I went to the kitchen and put on some coffee, fed Mr. Popo. Then I stepped out onto the front porch. It was early. A cool breeze drifted in off of the water, triggering the wind chimes in my trees. I could hear a lawnmower in the distance and smell fresh cut grass. I also could hear barking dogs in the distance. The ambient sounds of a living world were like music to my ears. Just hearing the car speed past on Summer Street flooded me with a sense of relief I couldn't put in the words. As good as it felt, I hadn't fully gotten over my nightmare or night terror. It was so real that my hands were still shaking and my legs were weak. It's crazy how a few minutes can feel like a few days or, or weeks in a nightmare. Trying not to think about it. I glanced to my left and saw Buddy, my Suburban sitting in the driveway. There was no dent in the door and the window hadn't been broken. <laughs> I couldn't help but smile. <laughs> Letting out a little chuckle, I went inside to fix a cup of coffee. That first sip was glorious. Oh. <sighs> If there's anything better than that first hit of coffee, it has to be illegal. Rather than flopping down on the couch and catching the news, I went straight to the radio and turned it on. All the stations were normal. I even checked 66.6. .6. It was just static. No max truth. Oh, thank God. After that, my morning passed by pretty quickly. I cut the grass, washed the clothes, and then hopped in Buddy and rode around for a while. It was so great to see people again. I got so caught up in the moment I lost track of time, realizing I burnt through a quarter tank of gas. I stopped and gassed up and headed home. As soon as I pulled into my driveway, my phone rang. Feeling it vibrate in my pocket, I almost came... It... It... <laughs> it almost came as a shock when... when I pulled it out and... saw Jay's number. <laughs> I had laughed before I answered. Hey, man. What's up? Damn. It was so good to hear his voice. We had a quick conversation. I told him partly about my nightmare. Holy shit, man. I'm sorry. You all right now? Yeah. I'm getting better. Well, so we arranged to meet up a little later, and when he finally showed up, I told him completely about the nightmare. Parts of it were a little hazy. Like most dreams, as time went by, I was starting to forget the details. After hearing me out, he convinced me I needed to have some fun to shake off the bad energy. Let's hit the east side. There's a festival at Maumee Bay State Park on Cedar Point Road. That might help. At least you'll be out of the house for a little while. And I know you love circus-type festivals. I... I, I can't explain it, but for some reason when he mentioned the east side, I felt uneasy. Keeping it to myself, I agreed, and after a quick stop for food, we hit the road. It wasn't long before we were near the tracks on Front Street. As soon as they came into view, I 
I got nervous. There was no train coming, but for some reason I swore I could hear it rolling across the tracks. It was so real, I slowed to a crawl, causing cars to honk as they swerved around us. Jay kept telling me to speed up, but I felt like I was going to be sick. It wasn't till we crossed the tracks that the feeling faded. Things sort of leveled off for the next few minutes as we drove down Front Street with no further uneasy feelings. I was just looking at the buildings and the trees and the street and traffic and, and just trying to smile. I was actually starting to feel better until we reached Cedar Point Road. When I looked up at the sign and I turned onto it, I started to get that uneasy feeling again. Then I saw something that nearly made me stop the truck. To my left, I saw the processing plant. I'd seen that place a million times, but for some reason, seeing it right then made my stomach hurt, and I broke out into a cold sweat. Flashbacks invaded my brain, replaying the look on Clyde's face just before that shotgun blast gutted him. I, it, it got so bad I had to pull over and, and let Dre, <laughs> I had to, I had to pull over and let Jay drive the rest of the way. We came up to the park and it was on our left and there was the sign, Mommy Bay State Park. <sighs> well, I was almost back to normal and we slowly drove through the park, looking at all the trees and listening to the wind and hearing people and we started to see smiling faces and hearing music from the festival put my mind at ease. We parked near the water and, and got out. We walked for a while talk, talking and, and taking in the sights and just enjoying the day. I stopped and smiled and listened to the living world for a moment. At some point, we wound up walking on the beach. I don't remember how we got there, but we were getting further and further away from the crowd. Slowly, but surely, the noise vanished, and I could feel the ground beneath me vibrating. Looking down at my feet, I watched the sand dancing around, and I could hear a train. But, but there was no train near this park. But before I could really think about it, I heard a voice with a southern twang that said something I couldn't make out. When I turned to see where it was coming from, there was no one there. Jay was gone. The beach was empty. And I could smell smoke. And there was that goddamn silence again. I, I wanted to yell. I wanted to run. I, I wanted to. I know I needed to get. I needed to get far away from there as I could, but I couldn't move. Tears filled my eyes as the sun turned black. And the sky, and the sky churned with gray clouds. <laughs> the world around me, <laughs> the world around me slowly turned to ash and crumbled away, leaving me hanging in an endless void. Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, I, I felt a hand on my shoulder and a voice.
Wake up! I woke up gasping for air. Phil, who was supposed to be driving, was sitting there smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer. We were parked at the crossing and the train was rumbling by on the tracks ahead of us. Noticing I was awake, he raised his drink. Hey, man. There he is. Almost thought you were down for the count. Rise and shine. End of the train's coming up. We're almost there. You ready? Where were you? Still a little groggy and wiping tears from my eyes. I... I... Oh, God. No. <laughs> no. This isn't real. I was home. I was... I was back home in the real world. Ah. Yeah, this is the real world, Tim. You need to snap out of it and come back. How long... How long did I sleep? And where are we? Not long. We're about six blocks away from the place I told you about. The train started up a few minutes ago. I can see the last car down there. He pointed to our right, then chugged the last of his beer. When I glanced at where he was pointing, I saw it for myself. My heart dropped, and my palms started sweating. I tried not to show it, but I wasn't sure I could go through with this shit anymore. Be sure to tune in next week, here, at Dark and Disturbed Tales, for the conclusion of The Replacements, The Day They Took Over.